Um, first off, the DWMCA is not a monolithic organization serving strictly only, and only those who are already pious or who have already uh, quote unquote attained the faith. Um, this organization is open to anyone and everyone who seeks self improvement and who seeks a personal connection with God. And our slogan, uh, which, has been which has been repeated throughout, uh, is a quote from a Rumi poem that ours is not a caravan of despair, ours is a caravan of hope. So come even if you've broken your vows a thousand times and come yet again. So we welcome anyone, and we are a community both of sinners and of saints. But spiritual progression is as much a right as one as it is the other. So building off that notion of community comes today's event, um, Red, White, and Muslim, Islam's Home in America. And 10 years ago, as I was uh, remarking earlier, 10 years ago, the, the same title as an event would have held a much different uh, lecture. It would have been about uh, Muslims in our role following 9-11 and, and facing a lot of security that we were facing. But now, as that dissipates, we, uh, the question no longer becomes that, it becomes who we are as a community, and as we self-actualize and become a greater part of the American fabric, what direction are we headed, um, what troubles face us, and if those troubles do face us, how are we, how are we dealing with them? Um, so it's with that that I'd like to introduce uh, Imam Soheib Lab from Boston, Massachusetts. After converting to Islam in 1992, Soheib, uh, uh, Soheib Lab left his career in the music industry to pursue his passion in education. His studies took him from the University of Central Oklahoma, ultimately to Azhar, um, in Egypt. Ultimately, uh, reckon, ultimately, the world recognized him as one of the leading Muslim scholars. He currently serves as the Imam of the Islamic Society of Boston uh, and holds an executive role at the Al Collins Institute. We're very fortunate and very blessed to have him here today. So, without further ado, I'd like to ask Imam Sahib Wad to please come up to the stage. Just a little or some note about uh, the event. Imam Sahib is going to speak, and then eventually we'll open up to a question and answer session. Um, if you have a question you're uh, comfortable asking out loud, feel free to raise your hand and people will call on you. If you have a question that you'd like to answer, like to have answered privately, um, if you want to write it down and uh, raise your hand at any time, someone from the board will. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa man wala. Allahumma salli wa sallim alayhi. Fil awwali wa fil ahil wa fil mali illa ala ya rabbal alameen. Assalamu alaykum wa sallam. MashaAllah. It's great to be here in, in um, the D.C. area with um, George Washington University and with all of you. And I'm very appreciative of you know, people coming out uh, on a weeknight. I know there's a lot of other things um, you could be doing. So JazakAllah uh, khair and Barakallah Fiqh. May Allah reward uh, all of you. So what I'm going to do is talk really about three things. And the last um, thing I'll talk about, you know, we might open it up for discussion. Um, but the first thing that I want to talk about actually is time. The issue of time and being able to appreciate um, a given epic and, and, and how that kind of plays out in our psyche as a community. Um, time and place, actually. The second thing that I'll talk about is the individual Muslim and, and their engagement of time and place, and in particular, of course, being here um, in America. And then thirdly will be um, institutional responses to where we are uh, currently. And, and somewhere in between, we'll talk about a little educational theory. Somewhere in between, I have a degree in education, I'm sorry, I just gotta do it. Um, some might interject, you know, a little, a little educational from in the mix. But that being said, time is very important. Time and place are extremely important. Um, and in the Quran, you know, we have like verses that constantly remind us of the importance of time. And, and it's actually done in a very different way. You know, there was a great scholar um, named Ibn Qayyim. He actually wrote a book about those verses where Allah swears on things. You know, by you know, the morning light, by the stars. And something that's interesting is that when it comes to time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not only swears on time, but also. Right? All of us would memorize that chapter. But he swears on aspects of time. I don't know what just happened. He swears on <laughs> aspects of time. Right? So he swears on you know, the early morning light. And the sun is bright. He swears on the night. One lady, either such Right? He swears on the nighttime. He swears on other aspects of time. And then he mentions Walasr. So the scholars, 
they noted that you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is swearing on aspects of time as particulars, and then he's swearing on time as a universal to illustrate its utmost importance. Our Prophet uh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you know, there are so many beautiful narrations that talk about parts of time and time itself as a universal. For example, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sahbihi wa sallam, he said, you know, Asbu, Ni'matan, we'll do like a TED talk. Ni'matan. You know, I feel more secure over here though. He said, I got the giggles, man. We get that Boston attitude. So he said, so he said, he said that there are two blessings that most people lose out on. One of them is free time. And he also said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the feet of people are not going to move on the Day of Judgment in front of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala until, until they ask about four things. Hatta and Yusuf and Arba, four things. One of the four things that everyone will be asking about is time. How do we use our time? Um, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a very powerful hadith illustrates that our Lord, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, transcends time. Whether into quantum or Newtonian realities, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is outside of all of that. And that's why the hadith of Sahih Muslim said, Anadda, I am time, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we believe that out of the 20 things we have to believe about God, right, three of them are related to time and place. That He has no time and He has no place. Al wujud, wal qadam, wal baqa. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists, that He has no beginning and He has no ending, subhanahu wa ta'ala. As is mentioned, in the chapter called the Iron Bull, that Allah is the one who has no beginning and He has no ending. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's very powerful for us because we worship the Lord, a Lord who transcends time and place. Scholars, you know, they mentioned interesting things about time. Uh, you know, Hassan al Basri said, Ya Ma'adam, Anta, Anta al Ayyam. He said, Oh, sons of all people. You're just days. It's like if you think about it, you just consist of days. And if your days leave you, then part of you has left you. That had a ba'aduk. Then half, you know, some of you has left you. It's a very powerful statement. Imam Ibn Qayyim, he said that I knew people, I met people who were more careful with their time than bankers are with their money. Right? And if he's alive today, he would say, and congressmen are protecting those bankers. But the point is, I'd say because I'm going to see. Point is, saying that people are very cautious with their time. And the Arabs, they have a lot of really cool idioms about time. They say, Allah comes safe. You know, time is like a sword. If you don't use it, you'll end up cutting you. Now, we're talking about time. We really need to appreciate where we are. And when the scholars of, of Islam, the early scholars, who were, were really you know, intrigued by cognition, they were, they were kind of like amused by cognition. And that's what caused them to run into Aristotle. And you know, they called Aristotle Al-Mu'annam al you know, the great teacher. They were, they were you know, somewhat kind of enamored by him. And you know, one of the first scholars to really talk about the concept of understanding vis-a-vis -vis time was al juwaini Not the father, but the grandson. We call it Imam al-Haramain. Imam al-Haramain died 478 after Hijri. You need to take some notes, man. You know, we got to get beyond the cheerleader and toss like, we're Muslims. <laughs> I ain't going to do that again. But the point I'm sore from yesterday. But the point is, point is, my sister's like, I don't watch it again. So, <laughs> well, al Juwaini, he was a sheikh of Al-Ghazali, right? And Juwaini is a student of Al-Baqilani. You should know these people, these important people, man. And al Juwaini, he defined knowledge vis-a-vis -vis getting time right. And that's what caused them to develop this approach. We're going to talk about this later on, because this approach becomes problematic in the transmodern era, understanding the time we live in, a time that reinforces the absence of meaning to people. Hence, on cable TV, you can run into five channels of evangelical Christian theology and then five channels of triple X. There's no meaning anymore, right? It's just, it's like a gumbo of, of potential. So uh, Joani, he said that knowledge Knowledge is to be able to conceptualize where you are. 
He said, at tasawwur, he said that the conceptualization, the knowledge that you have of a given era, agrees to that time that you are in, that situation that you are in. That's ilm. Ma'rifatu, to know a given place according to as best you can its reality. And then he said, ignorance is the opposite. To be ignorant is based on time and place, to have assumptions about a given time or place that don't exist. Now that takes us to where we are now in America as American Muslims. It's very important if we look at ourselves as individuals, if we look at ourselves as institutions, are we functioning in a way that would show we have a proper cognition of where the heck we are and what country we live in and where we are globally as a community, if we're going to grade ourselves based on our recognition of the time and place we're in, what kind of grade will we give ourselves? And that takes us, of course, into this topic. But I kind of know. MashaAllah. Jay Leno got met on. This joke. He's gone out of this. Point is that time is important. And what we mean by time is not just for real. No, what we mean are cultural norms, trends, fads, language, what's popping, what's not popping, what works, what doesn't work, sociology, where is religion in the current situation in America? Read a book by Diane Butler Bass called Christianity After Religion. It's a good book. It talks about the third space concept in the Christian church, how young Christians got tired of going to church, so they started renting out nightclubs and other places and doing worship there. Does that sound like Imam Zia? Without the nightclub? <laughs> oh no, I've talked too much. The point is you're going to find that there are certain things happening vis-a-vis -vis time. Now that takes us to how Muslims have reacted to, I would say in particular, being in America and also the current situation that we're in. We can divide ourselves via V time in a number of ways. Number one are the traditionalists. I say this with respect. I'm not on any team, but they call me a modernist. I don't know what the heck, you know, ask someone who found a modernity they even know. So I don't know how you're going to call me a modernist, you don't even know. That's very modern, by the way, to label someone, I don't know why you do it. <laughs> right? But number one is, yeah, I would say the Romantics. Not even the traditionalists, the Romantics. Because the Sotheby's and traditionalists, they do have a lot of common kind of philosophical underpinnings, right? The idea of retro dopeness. <laughs> and I'm not saying to make fun of anyone. Not retro fantasy land. So I remember when I converted to Islam, I met uh, a young brother using a dress with me, American convert, and he told me, you know, he was Hanafi, all respect to my Hanafi homie. He was Hanafi, he was like, you know, I, I want to live just like Abu Hanifa. And he started dressing as he thought <coughs> Imam Abu Hanifa dressed. Right? I don't know where he bought those clothes. <laughs> it, it, it worked for him. But the point is, you know, he became very ineffective to people on his block. And in fact, 13 years later after his conversion, we were friends before Islam. He told me I lost probably 75% of my friends because of my failure to appreciate where I was when I converted. The time that I was in. The opportunity that I had. Right? The opportunity that I had. So we have a romanticized notion that says all we need to do to function really in this transmodern epic in America is just go to the classics. Just play Illmatic all the time. <laughs> right? Those some people, see how young people are? <laughs> when were you born? Right? Illmatic. Oh, I'm like great. <laughs> Man, that's 20 years, bro. Yeah. This year. 20 years. 20 years. Did 20 years right now, right? Illmatic, right? Nazis for us out, right? An absolute gumbo of narcissism, but the beats are dope. The point is, point is, you can like that there's humor, but there's always something happening behind us. Don't get lost in it. Point is, point is, the idea of let's just regurgitate the classics. Right? From fiqh opinions to theology to Sufism to Salafism to however it went down, let's just go retro. Right? And in fact, it's quite common. I, I recently heard, I was at a convention, and I heard someone say, you know, these new opinions that scholars have that deal with issues, you shouldn't just listen to them, just read the old books. Now, what's, what's scary about that is it's very anti-tradition. If you look at, quote unquote, the tradition, whether it was the literalist or, you know, the, 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 um, 
the Sufis, you know, you'll find that it was a, a constantly, it was constantly being written. It was constantly addressing issues. You know, how, how did the Muslims get so Aristotelian in the first place? That didn't happen to the third century when Hellenistic and Greek thought came into the Muslim world and scholars said, we've got to bang with these guys, excuse me for speaking our language, we got to get, we need to get in these dudes' mouth. In order to do it, we need to master their tradition. We need to be secure in who we are to the point that we can understand Aristotle, we can rewrite Aristotle, and we can argue with people and defend what they felt was, was you know, orthodox. The point was they didn't run and hide, but they adapted. And in fact, Aristotle was so important that he completely changed how Islam was taught. Right? Look at how rhetoric is divided in the Arabic language. And you find that written in his book on rhetoric. It's the exact same thing. Logic, but still taught in Islam. I took logic, Aristotle, Aristotelian logic. I learned in Arabic. Weird. The little white dude, man, got Greek roots. The heck am I there? Aristotle in Egypt. Right? But then again, don't forget, Alexandria was the place for a while. But the point was, you know, we had to learn it till now. To read the classical text, Arabic is not enough. You have to know mantik. You have to know logic because the scholars were deeply influenced by it. Those scholars didn't react in the way that we would react now. They didn't say, oh, oh my gosh, this is going to change our deen. This is going to destroy us. This is going to ruin us. You know why? Because Islam was at a place of power. That's very important to appreciate time. Muslims haven't really been on the winning side of things for a while. I'm saying that with respect. And it plays out in our psyche. It plays out our insecurities. And it plays out how we deal with other communities. Those scholars of that age were emboldened. And they had Islam, and they engaged it. But they created a system. That system dealt with its time and place. Imam Ibn Khaldun in the Muqaddimah, he talks about when you can, how the educational system of the Muslim world changed and adapted. He talks about how in the beginning it was oral, then there was this, you know, like what he called jira semi, you know, the generation that heard everything. It was the Sahabi. Because, you know, 10,000 Sahabi to 12,000 Sahabi, as mentioned by Ibn Hajar, most of them did not read or write. So they heard it. They heard it. So they call them Jiva Semi, the generation that heard. Generation X, this generation listened. After that was Jiva Jemi, the generation that compiled everything that was heard. They rushed to save that oral tradition. Right? The third is Jiva Jemi. The third, actually, century and generation is, is, is the generation that started to compile now. And from that point on, you find a lot of changes happen. It didn't stay fixed. And that's the point I want to make. So there's this idea that, you know, what we need to do is just stay romanticized. And that's why I'll challenge you. Most of us as converts, we haven't written our own book. We translate books. You know why? We're too insecure. We're too scared. To say it honestly, I'll speak for myself. What about other people? Right? If you think about the majority of texts on creed in America, they're translations. Where is the book for the American Muslim? How do you function in a transmodern world? How do you function in a world where walking dead exists? In, in house of cards? <laughs> no, honestly. How do we function in a world where there's a hyper sense of exhibitionalism? People are taking pictures in front of their toilets in their underwear. <laughs> That's insanity, dude. I remember when I was not Muslim and my grandmother in the country was like, don't, can I say Mad Magazine? Remember that? I used to sneak in the restroom. You know, like an hour. Right? And my grandmother was like, you know, there's things in the restroom. She wasn't Muslim, but she still had this idea of like evil spirits. Linda Blair would pop out, throw the bottom over in the restroom. But the point is, we're in the age of exhibitionism. Right? Everyone wants to be an exhibitionist. I saw yesterday on YouTube, this dude jumped off some skyscraper at 3 o'clock in the morning in New York City with his camera. That's crazy. That's insane. I do it. I'm just saying. It's kind of crazy, right? Exhibitionalism. People are really into showing who they are. There's a good to that. There's a bad to that. What do we have to say about that right now? How do we speak to current challenges that Muslims face? And all of us have ran into people who have hijazes, people who are trained, people who went to Ezhar. We've asked some questions about our field of study, about things that we ran into, and ran into a brick wall. Ran into sometimes a brick wall. Because you know why? We haven't been trained that way. We've been trained according to the classics. The classics. So that's one kind of reaction to where we are, is romanticism. And it, it becomes kind of a battle for authenticity. Whoever can claim to be closest to the origin 
is the one who perceives themselves as having the most authenticity. And there's a problem with that because what it leads to is a sense of kind of self-righteousness potentially where, you know what, I don't have to have ethics anymore. Now, I'm sure it's going to come up, the whole issue about, you know, what happened online with International Women's Day. You know, my reaction was like, there's no ethical dilemma. If you talk about blacks and fried chicken and women, there's no freaking ethical dilemma there as a community. But again, we see the camp divided itself based on what? That trajectory of where we are, who's who, this guy's a modernist, this, this, this. There's no ethical dilemma. Like I said, go back to my neighborhood in Oklahoma and read that joke about fried chicken and black people. And then while you're getting beat to death, Screen context. <laughs> I'm just saying honestly, just, you know, just context to this. I say it with respect. Look, people are my friends, right? But the point is, the argument, if you look at it carefully, was based on who has authenticity, based on their ability to interpret the past. The second was really just to give up, right? There's another kind of like, you know what? Islam just can't function, man. It's limiting and limited. And I just don't find really much value in what it has to say for me. And then the third camp would be those somewhere who are trying to navigate. But really need to have you know, support because a silent minority is worthless. Right? A silent minority is really worthless. When I went to uh, Poland and asked the survivor of the Holocaust, I said, man, he was in his 90s. I said, who do you blame the most? He said, I blame the Jews who didn't say anything, and I blame other people who didn't say anything. He said, I blame them more than anyone else. The silent, silent majority. Now that takes us to two important questions about time. Everybody with me? Hope you are, inshallah, because it can get a little more complicated. But I'll try to keep it easy. And that is, what are we asked to be correct with when it comes to time in place? Because our community, we have a real big sense of insecurity. And that's rooted in expectations of perfection. We tend to expect absolute perfection. You know, I remember. I don't, honestly, I don't know if I'm still Muslim. Like, it's from a lot. Because stuff I experienced, like, my first six months of conversion, like, I had my Geneva rights violated. <laughs> it was crazy. <laughs> and people talked to me in ways that, that you know, my parents, mashallah, have been married for 52 years, man. You know, people would talk to me in a, in a quote unquote, a church in a way that people wouldn't talk to me like they would in the streets. And it, it, it's just a miracle because it's from a lot. You know, and I remember, you know, just learning to pray, man. You know, and making mistakes and people coming up to you afterwards. And like, it's like a TSA thing. <laughs> <laughs> like starting to pat down your pants, make sure they're rubbing your ankles. And I'm like, I'm like, dude, I, I just, I just became Muslim, man. I don't know. He's like, well, it doesn't matter, you know, according to six conditions, you know, reserving your your deen. And what's scary is no one is more modern than a hyper tradition. Real talk. Well, my teachers tell me that no one is more modern than a hyper traditions because they're ideologues. They can't function in a really, you know, kind of diverse and dynamic reality. So when I converted to Islam, you know, some of the experiences I had were, were primarily really good. And I would say that most of my insecure moments were from converts. Immigrants were amazing, dude. And I have a problem with all immigrant, you know, indigenous garbage. And immigrants were off the chain because they had humanized Islam through cultural experiences. My ex-wife tells me that, you know, converts and, and Muslims in the West, she said, when I look at you guys sometimes, it's like people who read a bike, read a, read a, read a, uh, a manual on how to ride a bike. But we just know how to ride. And she, I'm not saying that to demean you, but there's this uncomfortability about you. There's this insecurity that kind of follows you over once in Malaysia. Because I believe that imams, one of the major things that imam can do is sociology. I will get into the sewer to see things, dude. Because I think it's important. So in Malaysia, there's this m massive heavy metal concert. Right? I don't like heavy metal. Well, like, even though the lead singer of Iron Maiden is Muslim. How many of you know that the first lead singer of Iron Muslim? Uh, Iron Maiden. <laughs> <laughs> He's an Iron Muslim. Right? He's an Iron Muslim. Right? And I wanted to go and check it out. Like, how do Muslims do heavy metal, man? And I went. I was an old white dude there, man. It was amazing, right? So I'm sitting in the cut. <laughs> and come out with long hair. It's like some from the 80s, right? And I'm like, wow, man, this is like heavy freaking metal, dude. But they come out, their guitars, smoke, and he's like, Al Fatiha. <laughs> 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 the whole audience 
reason why I have any sense of stuff in Malay, and I asked my, my boy, like, what he says, you know, we're going to have barakah with Allah, you know, before. No, it's not funny. That's beautiful. I would rather be with a, 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 a sinner who's not a secularist, you know what I'm saying? Or a sinner that is a, that, that, that someone who is a sinner and not secular, than someone who, you know, is religious, it inverts that process. And it's harsh on people. That's what Imam Ahmed said. Imam Ahmed said, I would rather be back around a sinner that has a connection to God and character than a knowledgeable, pious person who's a jerk. So they, they bust out Fatiha, the whole crowd, dudes got like Lahibas and stuff. Like this Allah Rahim, Alhamdulillah, SubhanAllah, man, this, but it's, it's embedded in them in a nice way. I'm not encouraging you to smoke Lahibas, nor am I encouraging you to go to the Hebrew concert. I don't really care, so to you, you're an adult, you can do what you want. You need a sheikh to tell you what to do by going to a concert, not a concert. Hello. But the point is, what I loved about it was the fluidity of religion in the system. The lack of uncomfortability. So then I kept, I listened to music, it was all right, I didn't go back anymore. About halfway through it, about halfway through it, they stop. The drummer comes off his drum kit, and he's like, you know, he starts talking to Malay. My Malay is secret, secret, it's like really little. So I'm trying to like, and I realized how about someone died. And what he said in Malay was, check this out, I got it. He said, you know, the lead singer's mother died, let's all make God for her. So everybody stops, middle of concert, start making dua for this dude's dead mother. Whether you're for music or against music, that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is the lack of insecurity in the community, man. Because it's been socialized to a healthy degree. Where I still hear, be honest, when you walk in a Muslim community, man, you're, I have this problem, and I'm an imam, you're like, <laughs> you gotta act for it. Like, how to function here? It's like test for how to dress out. Don't sit like this, do this, do this, this. That uncomfortability, it should be there at a larger level, but not at a micro level. Not at a micro level. So the insecurity issue of how we dealt with time and place, I believe, is rooted in our failure to understand what Islam is asking of us. Islam is not asking us. To I know it's hard when people hear this. Because no, man, it's not the song that's going to be perfect. What are you talking about? I have to hold it down, I have to gain hard. No. Islam is asking us for perfect effort, not perfect results. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa has a beautiful narration found in Sahih Muslim where he says, in the Dina Yusuf, the religion is ease. And then he says something powerful. He uses the word when you shoot an arrow at a target, that's the same word he uses. Because I don't know about you, but if there's a target back there, I don't know what percentage of this room is going to hit the target. Let alone hit the center. And the prophet didn't use the word that said hit the middle of the target. He said, just shoot the freaking arrow, dude. That's the word he used. He didn't say it that way. <laughs> but the point is, he said, saddidu wa qari, which means shoot it and try to get close. And then the prophet said to Abu Hurairah, what I ask you to do, what I ordered you to do, do it as best you can. And that's why the scholars of Usul al Fiqh, we have an axiom, we're going to talk about axioms in a minute, that say, Al Amr al that the orders of Islam are based on ability. So scholars comment, they said, you know, Islam is not asking us for perfection, because that's impossible. But Islam is asking us to try, to put forth effort. And a lot of times we expect people to achieve perfection. And it creates a very uncomfortable community. I'll give an example. That show was American Muslims. What's the show? Like Lowe's and Kayak, what kind of, we forgot about that as soon as we need some cheap tickets. All American Muslims, right? You know, the Muslims were all just saying, oh my God, you know, this show, how they're representing us, horrible. Okay, no doubt, it's not the ideal Muslim, but how many ideal Muslims do you really know? But did you talk to non-Muslims who watch that show? I talked to my mother, man. My mother was like, this is the first time in 19 years after my baby changed religions and left our Lord and said, just stop, mom. <laughs> our Lord said, don't go that way. Our baby changed his religion. She said, that I actually understand you are normal people. <laughs> She said, because you're, you're an ideologue, dude. She said, you, for 16 years, I didn't know the heck you were. Right? She said, you used to call all these rules, this, 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 this. She's like, I, 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 I'm 70 years old. That was 
by the rules. I'll give you more. But she said, when I saw that lady struggle with a drinking problem, I can relate to that. And that she used her spirituality to overcome it, I can relate to that. So while we might have been in an uproar about it, you know, there were a lot of people outside of our little prism that we live in, our avatar world, who actually that served as a way to humanize us then. So the point is, Islam is not asking for perfection. It's asking for effort. It's asking for us to try. And we really have to change that as an institutional expectation as well as a communal expectation. Because when a community is expecting absolute perfection, you know what that makes them? That makes them absolute modernists. Superman. Superman is the apex of modernity, man. Adolf Hitler is the apex of modernity, keeping it simple. Right, that expectation that everything should be black and white, man. Halal, haram. And that's why we see Muslims in some ways have failed. This is where the tradition comes to be important. That when you study legal tradition in the Muslim world, you study court cases. And those court cases do what? They humanize the law. The law was practiced at a human level. So for example, in the Maliki Medhab, if you read the chapters on like cutting hands and lashing people, they'll always say, unless it's a new Muslim. Unless it's a new Muslim. Unless they're ignorant. Unless the person had this issue. What they considered at that time a psychosis. They didn't have the warning that we have for it now, right? Because they had dealt with what? With people. And people gave it a sense of robustness and humanity. So the second point I make vis-a-vis -vis time, after talking about how groups have dealt with time, whether romanticized notions of time, whether it being absolutely you know, relativist or the middle path, inshallah, is that Islam is not asking us to be perfect. And when we create these perfect communities with this perfect archetype, we push people away from the community, and we ourselves are who we are because we know we're not perfect. It's just impossible. Now, the Prophet Muhammad and his companions, they dealt early on with a group of people who thought that Islam asked us to be perfect. Who knows what the name of those people were? Al-Khawarij. And the Prophet, what did he say about them, the Sahih Muslim? The Prophet said about these absolute literalists, he said, Hum sharrul khalq. He said they are the worst of people. Let's go back. And in other narrations, you know, Imam al-Shatabi, he comments on this. He comes in the 8th century, he's an Andalusian legal theorist. He said, because in their... I'm trying to think in Arabic and speak English, I still don't have it, man. It takes a while. To switch, you know, Linux to Windows. <laughs> to iOS to the Android. Imam Shatabi said very beautifully, he said, because in their earnest to, to, to reach the goals and aims of religion, they push people away from it. And he, he wrote in his commentary something profound, he said, and that's why the Imam, the religious scholar, should carry people like a doctor carries a patient. You don't over-medicate, and you don't neglect. Because if you over-medicate, you'll harm them. If you neglect them, your harm them. And then he said, فَغَارُوهُ So the goal or aim of that scholar is al is It's moderation. It's moderation. Now that takes us to this beautiful idea that the Prophet ﷺ taught us that as a community, we're going to screw up. We're going to make mistakes a lot. And that's why Allah said about him, وَيَدُ عَنْهُ إِسْرَفُمْ وَالْأَغْلَالَ الَّتِي كَانَتْ عَلَيْهِ That the Prophet removes shackles from him. And what are meant by shackles here are this overburdening understanding of our relationship with God, man. That makes it almost, it suffocates people to the point that they can't have any room to make mistakes. And he said that he removes weight from them. And Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ أَن يُخَفَّ عَنْكُمْ Allah wants to remove burden from you. And in the second chapter of the Quran, Allah says, يُرِيدُ اللَّهُ بِكُمْ يُسْرُ وَلَا يُرِيدُ بِكُمْ عُسْرُ Allah wants ease for you, not harm for you. When we say this, people get insecure. Well, what do you mean by ease? Are you saying uh, uh, haram? Haram can be halal? Because we're so freaking insecure, dude. <laughs> Nobody said that. You said that to yourself. There's a thing called projectionism. You had the mental health thing a few months ago. Check it out, dude. P.I.J. Erickson. Point is, why do guys have to do that? We say, you know, Allah intends for us ease. Brother, um, you need to clarify what that means. Why? But whenever we say Allah doesn't intend for us hardship, no one asks us to clarify hardship. No one ever asks us to clarify hyper-conservative things. 
but it always goes into the past to be clarified. Allah says that his irada, his divine will, which existed before and after, is ease for him to facilitate a relationship with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in the Quran, he chastises people who close people off from that relationship. They block people from the way to God. They stand in front of that way and say, you're not allowed to go there. <coughs> Now the Prophet said about this, Bashiru wala tunafiru. Give good news to people. Don't push people away. And the Prophet said in another narration of the same hadith, he said, Sakinu. Tranquilize people. Right? Bring them tranquility. And the Prophet said in more than 14 narrations back to him that whoever causes a person to smile will enter paradise. Here it comes. He has only in the halal. He has only in the halal. <laughs> Whoever causes a person to smile, smile. So whoever causes a person to smile will enter paradise. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Now this imperfection carried over into his community. You know he empowered his community. What makes the prophet amazing is that you have this transcendent human being who embodies perfection but embraces imperfection. That's what makes him incredible. That's what makes people love him. So the prophet says, "I'm in acts of worship." In acts of worship, a man comes into the masjid of the Prophet وسلم, in Sahih Bukhari, and he makes ruku in the doorway. Right? He finds people ruku. He's so excited. He finds people bowing. So in the doorway, he's like, I'm going to get this. Boom! And then he walks, he walks like a butt you know, like a duck, to the. Now, watch that word, don't you? Sorry. No offense to the Egyptian people. And I know what that means in Egyptian slang. But he, <laughs> he walks. Yeah, don't have that. <laughs> he walks like a duck, you know, to the road, and he, he gets his thing on. And afterwards, the prophet, someone came to him like, yo, this, this dude. And that's how it should be translated. Our translations are horrible because they are meant to, to, to really be translated in a modern age, in an age where we use this really, really kind of gothic language or a language that has this blend of emotion. It's a blend of emotion. But when you read it in Arabic, it's like, I saw this dude. <laughs> or wherever you're from, you know, you put your little cultural kind of thing in there. Say, I saw this guy, right? He made a cool in the doorway. That's, that's like transit, you know, old messenger of God. <laughs> I just noticed. <laughs> You know, you're, you guys have a bath where you can pray. 
Whereas when he became Muslim and he joined the Salah, probably the same way. Because the need to be long is greater than the need to snub. Although he might go hand in hand. But the point is, the need to be long is more important for this young budding convert than to learn some of the So he joins a prayer, he joins Asr, his first prayer, look how excited he was. Do you go to Mark to live to his 80s? When he related this hadith, he still remembered, my first prayer was Asr, ever. Imagine if he told him, you got to go home, dude. I know it's in the water and desert. We'll walk out ways, find an oasis, do what you got to do, handle your business. You might catch my up if you did that. That hadith would have been very different. My first day in the community, I did learn I'm supposed to be clean, but I didn't get to pray with the homies. And I don't know. It was like, first experience was wonderful. But instead, he's in his 80s, he releases hadith, and he says, first prayer ever prayed was awesome. He, he remembered it. Those of who converted, you remember that. I remember my first prayer. I remember it until now. Thank God it was a good experience. So he's an awesome. What do you think someone does? They sneeze, man. What do you think he does? The first thing you learn, you're a convert. The first thing you learn, you're all hyped. Right? You think we'll do is far to make we'll do all the time. He's like, always have we'll do. You know, go to school, and I'm being a marine, right? I'm being You read the Fatiha to yourself. Jubel Nortim joins the prayer, someone sneezes, he says, Y'all come. People start to look at him. He's like, Yo, Hamakallah, and Hamakallah. Karatu Karim, I kept saying it over and over. Hamakallah, 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 Hamakallah. And then he said, People were like, <laughs> You know, because before the Sahabi used to talk in prayer, you know that? That's how butt wow they were, man. They used to talk in Salah. It was allowed to talk in prayer in the beginning, because they were not disciplined. So, you know, you walk in Medina, it's like, So, what's up? <laughs>
that your child will kill your other child? Was the next family is who? Satan and Noah. Oh, that's a normal family for you. Hey, son, I'm a prophet. Get on this boat. It'll save you. No, I'm good, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> and Allah says, in the Mulaysim and Ahlik, in the Mu'amal, Allah says, he's not even from your family. Normal family? The heartbreak of losing a son or a daughter? Let's continue. Satan and Yusuf. Oh, there's a normal family for you. Bunch of brothers. Take their little brother and throw him in the ground. And say, you know what? It's been real. Maybe someone will buy you and enslave you. Life is good, dude. He's out. Well, that's a normal family. Let's continue. Say to Muhammad, oh, that's a normal family. You know, uh, Ibrahim, single parent mother. Hajar, we never talk about this, man. Right? She raises a boy by herself in the desert. Imam Bukhari. Single parent mother. Shafi, single parent mother. Ahmed, single. Salahuddin, single parent mother. You never hear one khutbah in the masjid about single parent mothers. Why history, some of our greatest leaders came from their mamas. Imam Malik, he was lost and his mom changed him, Aliyah. Right? The point I want to make is does the Quran point a perfect picture of that? And those were the prophets. Right? So it's anything but perfect. So the prophet called Jabal and Martin to him. He said, come here, man. Come here, man. He was like, he said, I was terrified. He said, He said, I never saw anyone nicer than that man. He said, he didn't yell at me. He didn't insult me. He didn't insult me. He didn't hit me. He, didn't hit me. he just told me, look, look, look. We don't talk in prayer, do we? He said, don't talk in prayer. Just say, subhanAllah, alhamdulillah. Right? That, how the prophet dealt with imperfection in worship. Cradle issues. You know, man, we, we see, it's crazy, people online making tough fear of people. I mean, you've never met someone and you're going to say they're not Muslim? Or they are Muslim? Or how someone looks, you're going to say they're not Muslim? Are you insane? Imam Abu Hani, if you look at his maturity, he said, no one leaves Islam except the way they became Muslim. Think about when someone becomes Muslim, what do we do? Tabir! Lahab! When someone leaves it, it should be of the same kind of clarity. Right? Amen! And the Prophet talks about this man who's on his deathbed and asks his children, Sahih Muslim, to burn him. We all know this hadith and spread his ashes everywhere so that God cannot what? <laughs> to think that God cannot resurrect you is kufr. That takes you out of Islam, dude. Then the Prophet say, oh, and by the way, he's not Muslim anymore because he said that, according to the book, there's an Ethan principle that says he's not Muslim anymore. No, what the Prophet him say? He said that Allah SWT will bring him and ask him, why did you do it? And he's going to say, what? Because I feared you. And he will go to Jannah. So the hadith says. The Prophet said when a woman comes to me and asks about creedal issues, she gives a really jacked up answer, man. This is say anything to her. Umar al Khattab was sitting with his companions. He said, you know, I used to have a god made of dates when they got hungry and ate it. The days of oh, Omar, Safalada. Right? There was leeway. People were given time, man. People were given time to understand things and to acquire literacy, not scholarship. I would dare say that the average Muslim knows more particulars about theology than the Sahabi and Sahabi ever knew. Guaranteed. They didn't have time for that stuff. Let's continue. Social issues. Where people screwed up socially. In the time of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, you know how crazy it was, right? And I don't mean crazy; I just mean normal. Actually, how normal it was. Saad ibn Abi Waqqas, Abdullah ibn Zama, is sitting in a gathering with Sahih Muslim, and he's like, "That boy right there is my daddy's son." This is a conversation amongst the Sahaba. These are three or four people there from the Ten Promised Paradise. Saad stands up and says, "No, man, my my brother slept with your daddy's wife. That's our son." This is like Jerry Springer. <laughs> in the masjid, and no shame. That is not your daddy's boy. That is my brother's boy. Because back in the days, sorry, it was before Toba, my brother and your mom was cool. Right? Really, they were friends. And, and the prophet is there. He doesn't say, like, oh, God, so Allah, we shouldn't talk about this. Oh, we're going to shame the community. The prophet said, come sit down. And he adjudicated between them. So he engaged social issues. There were people that would come to the Prophet, it's kind of sad and funny, 
who became Muslim, and then come to the Prophet and like, you know, me and my wife, right, last night, we were watching camels, and <laughs> I realized that we're sister and brother, man. That's my sister. The Prophet was like, it's all right, man, no problem. It's been real. Enjoy this episode, Peace out. <laughs> He dealt with it, in fact, Allah says, إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ Unless it happened before you became Muslim. If it happened before then, before that time of Islam, no issue. But you actually have people come to him. You had a drunkard, the Sahih Bukhari, comes to the Masjid of the Prophet, drunk, man. You don't think that Muslims have a chemical challenge, not just in America? Man, I was in the Gulf countries, heroin, man. Weed in Egypt, bongo, right? Let's not deny it, but again, we want to create this romantic perfect image. Right? And those perfect images are fake and they're liars. And they cause us not to deal with reality. This man, he comes to the message of the Prophet, and suddenly he's drunk, man. And he, who does he ask for in the Sahih Bukhari? He asks for the Prophet. He's like, is the Prophet here? Translation is horrible. Because he was drunk. Right? His speech was slurred. And they take him to the Prophet. The Prophet talks to him, and he gets punished, and the companions, they start to shame him. They start to abuse him. And the Prophet said, <laughs> Don't help shaitan overcome your brother Yalib. He'll overcome him, back off him. The narration of Tirmidhi is even more powerful because the narration of Imam Tirmidhi, which has an extension to it, it's longer. You know, the man actually comes back after he's been punished and sits next to the Prophet. He's like, man, I gotta stop doing this, man. Like, like they have like a whole world. They have a relationship. So the idea of how we deal with our situation. I'm going to touch on two more things that I know. Number one is our approach towards knowledge. And, and I mentioned it earlier. Since the time of Al-Ghazali, right, the Muslims have really been stuck in this really particular way of thinking. We're all fuqaha. We've been fucked out, dude. What the fatwa, bro? Really? You're saying that honestly? No. Really? Now, if people get mad, I don't care. I'm an Ezra. We can bang all day. I gotta go around the show. The point is, I make a lot of mistakes. And I don't have a problem. If you differ with me, it's good. It means you're thinking, man. We have to get beyond that, right? It's healthy to differ, right? But the point is, fiqh as a science, has, as Sheikh Mustafa Zaka from Syria, may Allah help the people there, talks about how fiqh as a science has taken over the mind of Muslims and it was never meant to be that. Because fiqh as a science, deals with particular issues, tough CDS, rooted in Aristotelian logic. We don't have time for that, inshallah. One day if I'm living in D.C. or visiting D.C., maybe, you know, we'll talk about it. But the point is, it's had a massive impact on us. We can't see the big picture. I'll give you some examples. The Rug Life campaign, right? This is crazy. We never knew it was like, we're over rugged, we're rugged out. It was like a thousand pictures. We have pictures in Smithsonian right now. And people are like, where's my picture? Okay. <laughs> Work, right? We don't have enough people to post those pictures, right? But what happened was, and the beauty behind that whole campaign was a big picture idea that, you know what, you'll see people that you might say aren't practicing, I don't like that designation, by the way, but just using it for sociological reality. You see, like, people who, if you saw them, you might never think they're Muslim, and they're rugging it. You see somebody holding it down, you know, straight, you know, uh, religious conviction, right? Rugging it. So you create this universal sense of struggle, man. It's very powerful, it's very beautiful, and it's very harmless. And even, like, the little funny kind of, you know, subtitles that we did, we did on purpose to, like, relax people, because we knew this would happen. So a brother, he's just a convert, he sends us a picture, you can see his dog in the background. He's like, you know, I just converted, mashallah, I just learned how to pray, and I'm so happy to be a Muslim. What do you think the comments said? Oh, welcome to Islam. Congratulations. <coughs> We're happy you're praying for the first time. Barakallahu fi. No, what do you think all of them said? Continuous. We can't get around it. It's like the walking dead. We can't get around it. We're looking for terminus. We can't find it. <laughs> terminus is candles, by the way. We do it. The, the comic books are crazy. Yeah, so it's crazy. It's not a spoiler. Look, you saw what she was cooking. <laughs> you want to eat? Look at that meat from her. <laughs> the walking dead. They got no meat. What? They got a can of spam. Which would be halal if you're Muslim, but that's the difference. So, the point is, the point is, 
people started going off on him about Rover. And then he wrote me, he's like, they like, did I do something wrong with you? Like, I don't know. I, I was converted. Right? Totally jacked him up, pushed him away. Another one was, you know, someone put a picture of themselves praying, and like they might not be like, you know, doing according to how someone learned. So they might have their hands here, my hands here, my hands here. <coughs> Might you know have some pains in their back or whatever, maybe they did zumba, who knows? But they could, they're not able to really like, you know what I mean? And they didn't take their leave, whatever. They can't blame them, right? So what do you think people write? Oh, you know that like your raku is wrong, and da 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 da. Get a grip, man. I'll, I'll give you an example of how bad it is, right? That we've been infected with this way of thinking. I'm sure there's people in this audience right now. Is what he's saying out loud? Is he trying to change his name? This is too liberal. You know what? Because we're infected with particulars. But if I wanted to bang with you and say, where did you study and where did I study? What did you memorize and what did I memorize? So, oh, you're so arrogant. No, I'm not arrogant. I got called a spade a spade, dude. This is what I do. This is what you do. I have my lane. You have your lane. I respect your lane. Respect my lane. To you be your lane and to mine be my lane. Black and lane with plenty of lane. about being criticized or called out, well, that's healthy. But I'm going to show you why it's never a moderate calling out. It's always harshness. It's always like cold red. Recently, Mashallah in Boston had 500 people convert to Islam in two years. So we would post like, welcome to Islam, Sister Christine. Okay? You know, we're great to have this new convert in our community. So then we used to have this joke, like if it gets beyond 20, it's been a good night. So it's like, mashallah, 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 mashallah. Oh, we're gonna do it, man. We're gonna get to 20. Mashallah, 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 ma 17. Well, you know, <laughs> come on. It's not convert, it's revert. Are you crazy? Are you insane? Have you lost your mind? <laughs> And then she's like, well, I don't know what I am, but I'm happy. <laughs> right, whatever. Right, we could make it past 20. And in some cases, it becomes very harsh. Like yesterday, a sister from Malaysia sent me a text on Twitter, and she was like, you know, I had stopped praying, dude. And then this whole rug life thing, now I feel like empowered by the rest of the ummah that I can pray. Like people out there pray. Like I saw some pictures from sister praying in a library, man. I saw brothers in a prison praying. I'm not in prison except the prison of my soul, and I don't pray. And then someone goes in like, well, you know all the prayers that you missed in the past. You got to make up, and make toma, and this, 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 right? We laugh, we laugh. But this psychology, this educational outlook permeates our brains. That's why I said it's like the walking world. Whether we know it or not. Now that takes us into Theories of education, things that I want to Number one is I believe that we need to not teach the particulars first. This is a problem. So people sit down, you know, this condition of this, 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 very Aristotelian. Mahiyat, shurut, al asbab, all this stuff comes from Aristotle. I know some people are going to think you're trying to change things. You dang right, I am. <laughs> Unapologetically. Because it ain't working. It ain't working. Go to the countries that hold most strictest to the traditional interpretation. Look at their economic status, look at their human rights status, look at their transparency at a government level, and tell me if you want that. And I say that with respect, where if you really want to stick to it, they still, some of them, God forbid, still practice slavery. I had a woman come to me and say, I, I only want to get married according to my method, and that's it. When you write the contract, I don't want this modernist language. None of that. I said, are you sure? She said, yeah, she's Maliki. I'm Maliki, so I'll put it out there. I said, are you really sure that's what you want your contract to say? She's like, yeah. I said, okay. Ishtiala ul faraj bi la'iwat mu'tabar. If you understand Arabic, I can't even translate that, dude. It says, purchasing a woman's private parts for a monetary exchange. How many of y'all want to get married according to Malik you meant to have now? No, I'm good. I'm good. Take me to Vegas. <laughs> me and Kay said, be good. Right? And that's why scholars constantly change those definitions. 
And you look at the critique of one great mufti in Egypt, he said, that definition is the farthest thing from Islam as possible. He's like, you know, Islam said, mawadda wa rahmah, love and mercy. He didn't say, you buy this for that. I mean, that's something we did before we was. <laughs> it's not something we do after Islam, right? That's what you get arrested for. You know, you're like, well, for office in New York or something. You know, <laughs> uh, right? I'm not even that sister's husband. You know? And again, look how we ran that sister through the mud because of particulars. Whereas we have a sister in our community who's broken, whose husband has cheated on her, has put her through the ringer, is extremely embarrassed, and we're like, well, that's what you give her married a cow. Man, get out of here, man. And then we wonder why she doesn't donate or show up to any of our events. Whereas we should have said, you know what? On the DL, maybe someone can talk to her privately and say, before we talk to you about the filth issue of you marrying this non-Muslim, because it's not going to have an impact on her. Right? Why don't we talk about how do we help you rebuild? Yep. How do we help you, you know, go through this process as a community? Because we are into particulars. And we are actually like eating everybody. And it becomes very hurtful. The Mipsters, right? We're in DC. <laughs> you know, the whole Mipster thing, right? Whether you like it or not, the way the criticism was directed at these young women was ridiculous, man. It's like, you girls are going to change the team. They're not that important. <laughs> no one is that important. No, no, I'm saying, honestly, they're not going to change Islam. Like, they're not more important. Like, I'm not that important either. Like, we're not going to change the religion of it's protected by God, dude. You're not that freaking important. Secondly, skateboards and those MC Hammer pants and stuff, that's not going to change the religion. Whether you agree with that fashion sense or not, that's another story. That's open for criticism, right? I'm not saying anything. Mashallah, I thought it was great. Point is, look how people went after them. Critiques were very particular to the point that people forgot about having ethics. Maybe talk to some girls, dude. Like, as a, when I was non-Muslim, if you had approached any girl like that in my high school, you'd got hooked up later on. Then it came like a machismo thing. They're like, do you don't talk to girls like that? Our community? We forgot. I'm not saying that to be patriarchal. I'm just saying, like, dude, dude, like, these are people's daughters, man. These are people's wives. These, these are people. They're not avatars. But a particular way of looking at things and constantly trying to find those little issues makes us askew at this. Causes us to forget to be human. So number one, I suggest an, an axiom-based educational initiative in America. What I mean by axioms? You know, Imam Shatabi said that the Quran, are you guys okay? Everybody all right? Imam Shatabi said that the Quran is primarily an axiom based book. Universals, man. Sorry to be Aristotelian again. It's hard to resist. I'm as hard. But the point is, the point is, let me give you a few great axioms that think about that Abu Isa issue. Think about Misters. Think about uh, Anthony uh, Weiner, his wife, right? Sister. Uh, Huma, may Allah help her. How many people pray for her, man? Put their hands out, oh Allah, help her, make her life easy, man. You think that, how devastating that would be as a woman to go through something like that. But we'll say, oh, that's what you get. Say, man, come on, dude. Like, deal with reality. You know, and then you talk about how hard it is to get married in our community. And if you're over 30 and a woman in our community, or 35 and a woman in our community, man, it's tough. It's tough. Right, it's hard. If you're divorced in our community, you have divorce services in our lives for people. Come on, divorce? Abuse? First thing I did in Boston, second week I was there was open up a mental health clinic. And I said to them, the imam doesn't counsel anymore. I don't know how to do it. I need counsel, dude. Right, give me some fluorescent. <laughs> Not fluorescent. Something else. Right, take a gender child. <laughs> I'm smoking each other. Why not? Why not? A lot of weed. Don't say stuff a lot. No, 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 that's how that seems cool. Oh my god, no, no, that's gender. Don't be so insecure. Oh no, but I, I, I see a sister right now in the back. She's like, Lakum Janukum Waliya Janati. You know what you want over there? I'm gonna do what I want over there. I said that, I said that in Canada. So when I die, inshallah, and I go to Jannah, maybe my barza. I can't wait. I used to be a big fan of Cypress Hill, man. I can't wait. And, I, and someone was like, a stalker. I was like, that's my Jannah, man. There's no stalker on Jannah. 
Because that's what it's mashallah. Again, that joke was done on purpose to show you how insecure we are. I did it on purpose. When I said what I just said right now, some of you were just like, it's Jannah. It ain't dunya. There's no haram and haram agenda there. But that shows you how insecure. And I would love, if my son came to you and said, Dad, I just want to smoke a fat, sticky, easy dude. I, I can't stop. And I said to him, you know what? You get a jump, man. Just be patient. That'll work. And I said, you know what? In a jump, you're going to show you going to enjoy it. And it's free. <laughs> I would rather be able to say that to my son than like, oh, I'm stuck for a lot. I don't know. To this man, it's one of the best things that kept us away from slipping was we had a shit who used to say, when you see something that you used to do and you want to do it, just say inshallah. And that saved us for about a year. <laughs> we were on campus. I was pledging alpha, man. 1906, dude, I was crossing the burning sands. And I kept telling myself, inshallah, 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 every second, actually. Right? For the first three months, it was like every second. Right? Then it was like every hour, every week, every month. What was that? was a smart shit. And we were like, anything? They're like, ma la ra'ayun ra'at. The eye has never seen it. And the heart can't imagine. But as a community, we actually want to control someone's paradise. I did it all on purpose. It was a setup, isn't it? <laughs> to show you how freaking insecure we are. That we even get nervous about people saying, in Jannah, I'm a kick it. And then no one will stop me. Oh, oh, oh. Get, get yourself together. Get yourself together. Are you saying the Quran is halal? It's Jannah. Right? The Prophet he taught us these axioms as well as the Quran. And I believe that these axioms will empower us in America because religion now is not going to work based on the classics. You can't function in society and try to teach people the classics. For example, go to any classical book of fiqh and read what they say about, about people of color. Just read it. You tell me in a post-MLK America, that's going to work. You tell me how on earth could you even see that as an ethical person? Some of the issues about women, there is patriarchy in their tradition. Let's be honest, man. Oh, God. Oh, no, 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 no. We're talking about what people did. May Allah forgive them. I'm sure their intentions were good. They lived in a certain era. You know, they get what they are, we get what we are, but we are responsible for what we got to do, not for what they did. But what happens is we become more defensive of them than we become of our own reality and staking our own definition where we are now. And that's why I say, if the Prophet Muhammad was alive now, so he wouldn't teach a classic book. That wouldn't happen. He would guide us according to where we are at this moment. And we forget that. So let me give you a few axioms. Think about what just what happened, right? Here's the first axiom scholars brought, which is powerful. Concern is for meaning, not terms. Think about how that plays out. Convert, revert. Dude, call it what you want, man. It doesn't matter. Who cares what you call it? Because scholars realize that if we get caught up in arguing about terms and never define the meanings of those terms, we're not going to get anywhere. So this is an axiom used by our scholars in ethics, in debate. Al-ibratu bil ma'ani laysin bil asma. Concern is good for the meaning. Call it Sufism, call it Ihsan, call it Tawheed, call it Aqeedah, call it Tajr. You call it what you want, dude. But how many times have you seen our community get into arguments over what we call things? And we waste time. So the scholars were like, time, where we started, is a lesson. That's one axiom. Here's another axiom. La jarha bil madhab. There is no criticism by labeling people. Feminazis. I say it with respect, man. Salafis, Sufis, this, 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 this. That's not how we roll. It's very similar to the academy. If you want to criticize someone, you better be able to back it up. But just don't label them. Because labels are hurtful. It allows us to dismiss articles with, this person is a modernist. So what? Have enough guts to engage them. So this accident. La jarha bil madhab. This is a Shia. This is a Sunni. Imam al Bukhari in his Sahih of Jami' related hadith on behalf of Shia. You tell me, Sunni is this? Oh. Get the ventilator, dude. Get the ventilator. 
Same guy working on my agenda. And he's still like, we need Heck yeah, big bricks. <laughs> point is, point is, he did. Imam al-Shafi and his Musnad led the hadith on behalf of Shia. Ayatollah Khomeini, Allah Ya What did he say? He said, if you are a Shia and you go to a mosque that's led by a Sunni Imam, pray behind them. The point is, man, get the bigger picture, dude. Don't get caught up in little issues that are going to stop you from moving forward. That's why the scholars laid out these universities. There's some others that are very profound, very profound. I'll give you a few. And these are the five that scholars agreed upon. These five are agreed upon between all five methods. Right? Number one, al amur bi actions of our intention. Plays out, and Imam Shafi said in every aspect of Islamic law and law. Number two, very beautiful, al urf muhkam the custom of a people takes precedence. We'll explain this in the future, inshallah, because we don't have time. Number three, al mushaqqa tajibu tasir hardship makes things easy. Hardship makes things easy. Right? The next one, al dar yuzab harm is removed. Harm should be removed. Whatever it is, remove it. Remove it. The last, al yaqila yazulu bishak certainty is not removed with doubt. Imagine if we started to educate ourselves on these axioms, how we would engage the world. And I see what would happen out of that, and that's why with new Muslims, I start with axioms. I would start with particulars. Why? Because that empowers people to start to create their own language for the reality that they live in. As Imam al-Haddad said, they tie the heavens to the earth, man. If we, if we master the tradition, I will tell you, 99% of what I learned in Azhar, you wouldn't understand one bit of it. You say, oh, it's another world, man. But where is, where is the language that speaks to people now? Where is the language that speaks to problems now? One of the ways to give birth to that, I believe, is an axiom-based education, what I call al-qawaid. Right? And scholars, in Imam al-Qarafi, al Madik, he said, whoever learns the qawaid, has a quick literacy of the scale. We ask most Muslims, hey man, why are you going to that weekend course? I want to be a scholar. A scholar? Hey, why do you take this you know, one year Arabic course? Oh, I want to be a scholar. What happened to wanting to be a scholar? You know, Abdul Hamid al Qasim, he studied with Malik for 20 years. He said, 18 years I learned character, two years I learned about law. He said, I wish I could take those two years and give it to character. Character development. Simple akhlaq, simple good behavior. Now the last thing we'll stop here because we're running out of time and I apologize is that we should focus on particulars in three areas as individual Muslims. Because each and every one of us has a responsibility to learn the individual obligations. Number one is Islam. But what I mean is that's defined by the Prophet. And when I'm saying Islam, I mean an experience. Did most of the companions become Muslim because of cognition or an experience? An experience. You know, Allah describes the Islam of Umar. He said, the one who is dead and brought to life. He's talking about Umar. Right? Then there's Salah. Look at this rug, rug life campaign. Like, it's weird, man. We didn't know. Like, people liked it. <laughs> like, oh, come on. Look at my kitty cat on my rug. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. We like cats. I got one dog. <laughs> but, wait for a chicken next. <laughs> point is, you know, it allows people to have a meaningful relationship not just a inherited or cultural relationship. What does it mean to you? What does salah mean to you? If you were to nickname salah, what would you nickname? Fasting, hajj, those things that we have to know in detail. And those things don't change. They are what they were, they will be. Next is iman. But I will say this, when it comes to the Islam meaning the fit, I believe that the road ahead in America is to really, instead of worrying about method, you have to listen carefully because it's controversial. I'm just laying it out tonight. I can care less. I'm living here. <laughs> <laughs> Is we need to adopt fiqh opinions that are going to function best in this culture, in this reality. As long as those fiqh opinions aren't considered strange, as long as those fiqh opinions aren't considered shad, which means they were rejected by the scholars, I'm talking about in this larger body of fiqh. For example, Women can marry without a wedding. That's the opinion of Abu Hanif. People get worried. That's the opinion of Abu Hanif. If you got a problem, I'm not Hanafi. Don't bang with me. Bang with Abu Hanif. The point is, in a, in a culture that reinforces to women that Islam is tyrannical to them and patriarchal to them, it might be wise to adopt valid pick opinions 
that give them a sense of value and a sense of independence that stay within the realm of orthodoxy. A, a simple example, um, you know, uh, a lot of kids in high school, they have to make prayer at high school, right? So, you know, can you imagine like your foot in the sink in high school, dude? <laughs> like someone walking in like the jocks, you know, like, <laughs> right, and say you're like 5'1", 125, you know, you're not the biggest dude in the school. Chapati's ain't started kicking in yet, you're still kind of small. And the next four years, you're going to be labeled foot the sink. <laughs> right? They came to me, a bunch of high school boys, and they were like, Imam, it's just hard to make a do a school. He's like, I know you're going to tell me, like, trust the lie. Like, it's just not that easy. Like, I got beat up. It's not easy. And I can't go and tell. He's like, no, I went to school here. I know you don't tell. I'm like, I don't know. Okay, either you go learn how to box and handle your business, <laughs> or you take the hand money that, that, that allows you to wipe on cotton socks. And they were like, hey, you can actually wipe on cotton socks? I was like, yeah, man. That's what I mean. People that are going in business suits. You got your Hickey Freeman, $1,600 suit, you're looking good, you're your money, you're in a meeting, you cannot have water all over your body when you walk into that meeting. I'm not making fun of anybody, but you got a nice dress on, you're looking good, whatever. Another thing, women, you know, the jilbab, we adopted, and you've already done it, felt opinions that say the jilbab is not one garment, it's a multi-piece garment. What I'm saying is, and that's why we need to strengthen these Philip institutions in America, like North American Philip Council, right? Where there needs to be books written that articulate from the tradition, right? Those opinions that are going to be best apt for our reality. Issues of like free mixing, all this kind of stuff, right? Most people don't even care about it, but it should be out there to support the activists in this situation. We're not talking about changing Islam. We're not talking about changing the deen. We're talking about scholars, fuqaha, muftis, engaging the law, answering questions that are legal based. I'll give you a good one, the meat issue. Man, if you don't eat my mother's meat in her house, she will kill you. <laughs> Less of course. Real talk. Right? I understand we, we might go to pull the meat issue because the Jews have culture. I get that, it's cool. But for some of us as converts, man, that will work. It just I remember I came home, my mother cooked a steak for me, man. My mother's from the country, and I didn't eat it. And she was like, she didn't talk to me for like two years. You think the Imam that told me not to eat it helped me deal with that? Did he find me another mom? Did he help me navigate the issue with my mother? Was he there every time I called her, she hung up the phone on me and said, hey, you know, A1, click. Times <laughs> 57, click. <laughs> no. And that's the point I'm trying to make here, that there needs to be a body of answers to questions that are rooted in our reality. Now, the last point we'll talk about are institutions, and we'll finish here. Institutions, if we look across America now, there's like little islands popping up of, and I'm saying this with all respect, kind of like normal institutions. I'm not saying that others haven't been abnormal, but when I travel, I look at Muslim institutions, I'm reminded of the last conversation that Martin Luther King Jr. had with Harry Belafonte Jr. And that was the burning house conversation. You know, Harry Belafonte Jr. said the last thing Martin told him was that I believe I am pushing my people into a burning house. That what awaits them is not a land of milk and honey, but is a land that has some very serious ethical contradictions. And his biggest concern was foreign policy, and then, you know, wealth distribution in America. MLK Jr. was committed to the idea of taking care of poor people. And it, it worried him to the point that he said, we are asking people to go into a burning house. We tell Muslims all the time, go back to institutions, go back to massages, you're going to find terminus, right? But we might be pushing them into burning houses. Because all of us have had experiences in institutions, or a large percentage of us, that have kind of hurt our feelings, man, and questioned our value as Muslims, right? But across America, you're starting to see little islands pop up. And, and I, I'm being subjective here, so I could be wrong. I say that they're like islands of more normality, like Iman in Chicago, like Ta'lif in California, like what Na'man uh, is doing, uh, Sheikh Na'man and Abdul Nasser in Texas, right? What Khadr Latif? is doing in Manhattan, what Imam Zia is doing in DC. It's not to say others are bad, we should not adopt that language of you guys are horrible, we're normal, we're all normal, no. But what I mean by normal is vis-a-vis -vis the prophetic model. Come as you are to Islam as it is. Right? 
We celebrate the convert, but we don't despair over the one who left us. Right? If we despaired over those who left us, as we celebrate those who converted, our communities will be a lot better. Think about it. When someone converts, we party. But when someone leaves, you're going to hear about it. So I believe that institutions in this country, as your generation grows up, has a great opportunity really to play a major role in creating a normal religious experience for us. When we ask most Muslims in America, what are you looking for? They say community. I say community, dude. I'm lonely. You talk to young 30s, 40s, converts, man. You talk to converts over 35. Think about it, man. They don't have any Muslim family, dude. I know a convert, he told me for the last 12 years, my wife and I, every Eid go to IHOP. No one invites us. Dude, it's jacked up, dude. Pancakes on Eid. Like, no. Maybe the Waffle House, but it's not IHOP. <laughs> you know, my wife was like at the club back in the day. You know what I mean? The point is, we haven't created a sense of community. And that's what I meant by normality. Where people can walk into an institution and not worry about being blasted because they don't have hijab on. Whether they can walk into a community, his beard is in a certain length, or maybe his clothes on a certain way, or maybe he's hot, man. I had a brother walk into the masjid in Boston. We found him in the restroom with a hair needle in his arm. And I hugged him and said, I'm just glad you're here, man. I'm glad you're high with me, dude. No, I would rather have you high with me in my office than high in the projects. Real talk, right? Because when you come to, when you come to, we're gonna have a conversation about what's going on in your life, right? When I have a young girl walk into my office and say, "I've been sexually abused by males and females in my home since I was ten," right? I say to her, "There's no better place I'd rather have you be." This question right now with me as your imam. I embrace you with that challenge. Now, get out. And then she's like, I trust you. What do I do? Read Fatiha? No! See a clinician. And here is our clinician. We have a clinician on campus at all times, man. If there's an imam meeting people, there's a clinician on campus. And she's like on the road to recovery. She started her own abuse program now for people. So the point is, those pockets of normality, what I mean are those pockets that embrace the community where it is, man. And expect there to be a responsible growth. But let people grow. We always have this conversation as I finish. Where we say, you know, we can embrace people, but we got to make sure they grow. No, you don't. We're talking, how, how average Asian people is from how old you think? Definitely over 25. People here don't know how to grow. People here aren't responsible for themselves. We don't trust people here in this room to eventually get it together. Yeah, we'll, we'll spark that process. We'll help you along. We'll be there with you. We'll be crutches that help you walk through that process. But we don't need to walk around like lifeguards at a swimming pool. <laughs> Sister. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that's what we do. And the Prophet said, he didn't do that. And the last point I'll make at an institutional level is Imam Shatta, he talked about this. He said that the maqas is sharia, right? The objectives of sharia. I get tired of the theoretical discussions about them, right? People sit around and fantasize maqas and maqas and sharia are found in institutions. Rhetoric deals with maqas and sharia. And an institution should look to do the following. Number one, allow people to facilitate the possibility of a relationship with God. That's the first responsibility of any institution that claims to be Muslim. That's going to represent a spiritual tract is to open that possibility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the Prophet. Number two is to offer programming that's meaningful and powerful and changes people. Not just let's sit and have a talk. I hate it, man. One time I gave a talk to some people with a prezi. I thought I hate it using a prezi. And some brother came to me after he's like, was like, was this was this halal? <laughs> he's like, was this halal? He's like, I use images, like I use this turtle formation and kung fu movies. I said, how shade turtle formation? <coughs> I, had, I had this image of someone walking across uh, a tightrope above Brazil. I was like, you know, how, why don't we function like someone like walking on a tightrope? Like, I used images. And he was like, this is hell out. Like, because I've never learned this way before. Like, it was exciting. It was boring. So really having 
meaningful experience. And that's why I like what ministers did, man. Whether you agree with it or not, the idea of just pushing the envelope and letting people express what faith means to them, man. And let people make mistakes. Stop being police about it. Let people grow, enjoy, fall, succeed. When I was training to be a Mufti in Egypt, I had a share from Iraq. Iraq is no play. And, I, and it was Juma. It was Juma. And this guy knocked on the door of my sheikh and he's like, the Imam, the Khatib, is not here. We need a Khatib now. So my teacher, he was in a wheelchair. So he's like, I have a Khatib. This is an American dude right here. I was like, in English? He's like, no, in Arabic. And I was like, but I'm going to make mistakes. He said, of course you are. But that's how you go. He said, I'll write down your mistakes and you'll learn later on. A month later, he had me write a fatwa. And I was like, I can't write a fatwa, dude. I can't do it. I'm scared. I can't do it. It's like Kevin Hart. He said to me, <laughs> he said to me, you know what? You need to learn how to make mistakes, man. It's healthy. So an institution that embraces the fact that people are going to make mistakes and embraces those mistakes as being part of our community. What did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say about the Sahaba while they were making mistakes? Allah is pleased with them, they are pleased with him. They were perfect. But still, they had rida. They reached the maqam of rida. So, meaningful, impactful, incredible profession. We have this problem with professionals. Wallahi, we are like Pavlov's dogs. I'm sorry to use dogs. Where mediocrity has become normal. So that when people see something that's not mediocre, like the guy the Prezi, there's like, like, no, but that's, it doesn't suck. Like, it's good. <laughs> no. Right? We've become accustomed to mediocrity. In your generation, you're not going to put up with that. The third thing is that we need to be as ecumenical as possible. Right? We need to allow <coughs> the broader community of Muslims to participate and be part of Islam. And not as we did in the 90s. Because before 9 11, we were, we were worried about self identification. So we had all these sects. After 9 11, we projected it out to the broader culture. The millennials, who the heck are you? How do you identify yourself as a Muslim in this age? So I believe we have to be as ecumenical as it is as possible. We don't have enough time. I just touched on points that are probably bigger points. But I just want you to think deeper about some of the things I said. Number one is how we deal with time and how you look at time. There's only one thing that's held as completely sacred in time. That's the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet. Everything else, you know, that's a longer discussion. Number two, we talked about the idea of perfection that kind of inhibits our community. It's a very modernist outlook, by the way, right? That we're asked to be perfect. We're not asked to be perfect. We're asked to try our best, right? And even trying our best, we should try not our best. It's just the reality, right? Then we talked about individual responsibilities in education. And I talked about how the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and I didn't get into this, but how the early, early, early generation of Muslims were very axiom-based. Their understandings of the summer, right? Look at, look at Omar. When, in the Muatta, when they get to this pond, and someone offers them water to drink, and the Amr al he says, you know, I don't think we can drink from this water because we don't know what kind of animal has been there. And Omar says, we have not been asked to ask about those things. Drink. It's a universal vision. <coughs> and he, he rocks it. The Prophet said, when he was given water from a non-Muslim woman, right? He uses it for wudu. You read the classical books of film, it could be disliked and might not be permissible. The Prophet used it, dude, like with all respect, right? Why are we suddenly restricting what the Prophet sort of made us vast? I say that with respect for absolute adoration of tradition. <coughs> then we talked about how, after an axiom based reality, and I didn't have time, how each and every one of us has to be responsible for our own education. Imam Suhaib is not going to do it for you, Imam Ali Khan is not going to do it for you. You are responsible for yourself. This whole Imam Savior Syndrome, man, it's not healthy. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. It is not healthy. And it creates a sense of, you know, uh, reliance on people. That's not healthy for them either. Right? But the point is, you are responsible for learning the basics. You are responsible for your Islam. You are responsible for your Iman and your Ihsan, your Tasul. Those are the three cores. The workout, there's kettlebells or whatever, you got your core. The core workout of Islam is Islam, Iman, and Tasawwuf. Ihsan. Oh, why do you say Tasawwuf? Because there's no arguing about terms. I did it on purpose. But that's what we always do. 
And then finally, we said that how institutions have to play a role. And really, these, these associations of scholars, like the whole incident that happened recently with, with the Sheikh Abu Isa Hafiru, it could have been handled by a large body of scholars and they would just gave some basic guidelines. Hey, this is how we feel about it. You know, this maybe should have known what it was handled. So, hey, you were tripping. Whatever. Fine. But at least there's like general guidelines for people within like how to function in the, in the, in the situation now. And then we said institutions. The institutions, their main job is to really facilitate a relationship with Allah's problem. And to give people a sense of belonging and a sense of empowerment. You know, a sense of uniqueness, a sense of wow, subhanAllah, you know, I'm getting something out of this. Right? It's not just, I gotta go, oh God, here we go again, whatever. No, but a sense of really being valued and sharing value, value buy-in at an institutional level. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all of you. I know it's a lot to think on, and I know it's a lot to digest. Some of the things I said, write them down and write your reflections, send them to me. I'll engage you. Right? I'm not asking you to walk out of here and, and understand everything I said or agree with everything I said. No. These things are open for discussion. But it's been a great time. I always love coming to DC, especially J GW, mashallah. Barakallah Fiqh and Assalamu alaikum.
think you might answer that as an example. That's not my teacher. Why is he busy? So what I would do is find out, like, are there things I can do to alleviate his business? Like, honestly. Like, sometimes, like, when I was trying to study with a teacher one time in Detroit, he never had time for me, right? And then I went to him and I was like, what do you do? He's like, you know, I only have one car and I have eight kids. He's like, my wife works and I pick them up and take them to school. I was like, I'll go. Like, me and the homies, like, we'll organize it. We'll pick them up and take them home so you can teach us. And he taught us. Wow. Right, so I try to find out, like, like, what's going on in their lives that's taking their time. How can I, like, facilitate, you know, and, that, and that's really where there's hitting to the rhythm. That's what we mean by being respectful to the scholars, actually. Not like, oh, and all that stuff. That's cool. <laughs> you know, man, that's fine. It's a but really, when you love someone enough to say, you know what, man, I want to study with you, dude, or do that. And do that never makes a problem, by the way. But I want to study with you, and you don't have time. Is there something that I can do that will free up the time that you can teach you? So locally, that's one thing I would do. Secondly, man, you have to look for knowledge. You know, before I went overseas, I studied for 10 years. Now. I moved to Detroit. I moved to St. Louis knowledge, man, in America. So I studied with a scholar from Yemen. He's a student chief of Mount Temi in Detroit, right? Dr. Salah Sultan is in prison now in Egypt, I'm not free I moved to study with Sheikh Mohammed Noor in St. Louis. I went to study with him. Right? So before, you had the Ma'ad here in D.C. and all that other stuff, right? So we actually used to go, I used to drive 45 minutes every day to read the Quran to a Sheikh back and forth every day for 10 years, right? So it's not romantic. You have work to put off, man. If you really want to seek knowledge, sincerely, you know, the Arabs have a nice statement. They say, if the, if the woman's pretty, you don't care how much the mind is. <laughs> when you get upset, girl, and if the guy is fine, you don't care how cheap the mind is. Point is, if you love some people, you're going to... It's like you're laying choking. you driving home like... Quite a bit all 
abandon the community, if we, don't, if we don't engage the community, and we don't make our voices heard, we don't have a right to complain. Right? So I would say need for critical mass at a local level. Right? And, and that's why I tell people, if you can't find an institution that serves you, go to one that does. Right? If you have to drive, if you find, you know, this, you know, you imagine that's the guy who, like, mashallah works for you. They go there. Right? It's like a doctor. I don't go to any doctor. I yell a doctor. Right? Well, I'll yell at a restaurant. You know what I mean? And this is like a list. I yell a list of percent. Are they friendly towards women? Are they friendly towards the youth? How do they treat people who, you know, might not be that religiously outwardly observed, for example, right? Those are things that need to happen. But locally, in the D.C. area, you have, especially like Imam Zia and other people, right? You have a critical moment historically where if young people are able to kind of coalesce and create, you can do that. And see yourself in that role. Don't see yourself as yeah, on the outside. No, see yourself as architects of what this is going to look like for your kids. As a convert, how many converts in here, man? Man, I'm scared for my kids. My daughter, my daughter's a mix. And, and I'm, you know, we're divorced. So my daughter goes, goes walk into a school where she's mixed ethnically, right? And she's a daughter, you know, of a divorced man. And she walks into the community and she's been subjected to some racially crazy stuff. Right? To the point I said it to my nation. Because it's just crazy, right? For converts, we have this question all the time. We don't have that family backdrop that people have culture. Right? It's us, Allah guided us, what's going to work for our kids. Right? So I would say don't see yourself as you know the observer. No, you're the architect. And you need to find people that you can get with and coalesce around and create a community that's good for you. No one should say that's dividing the woman. It's not dividing the woman. It's pluralism, which is needed, and it's also allowing people according to where they are to maintain their image. I would much rather have a hundred masjids where everybody's maintaining their iman than one masjid where only a certain type of people go. Yes, my brother. Assalamu alaikum. Sorry about that. Um, it's, uh, just really quickly, it's interesting that uh, people bring up Imam Majid because actually uh, I had a such situation where I was sending him emails to ask him a question once. And my, <clears throat> and my best friend said, you know, uh, and I kept on complaining to him how he doesn't answer and everything. And it's like you said, he's very, very busy. Until uh, he took me to Adams on a Monday night at like s at seven o'clock, and Imam and Imam Majid is sitting right in front of me teaching Imam Al Ghazali. And if you, if everybody, if anybody has ever met Imam Majid, he never. If you have a question, he's not going to walk away. From he devotes his attention all to you. So, in, in that respect, it is very easy to find him if you really, genuinely, you know, make the trip because it's just thirty minutes. From and most of the imams are like Imam Suraj. I see Imam Suraj so busy, so busy. I go to work with him right there. Damn. He's all by himself like an hour. And I'm like, <laughs> right? I went and talked to him. And like, so a lot of times I'm just reaching out and like, seeing that that's not the case. But sorry. Uh, no, it's fine. And then the second thing that I was going to talk about, you know, when, you, when you were bringing up the, uh, that, the concept of a perfect family, it's, it's kind of how that's been skewed in this country to, you know, first of all, people overseas tend to tend to look at people in America and say, wow, you guys pray over there? And we're like, dude, you guys are 100 miles from, you know, you're, you're a two-hour flight from Mecca and all this. But but what you're saying about the family, to, take, to what really hit home is, um, you know, there was a situation that uh, we had in my family where we had somebody who was addicted to alcohol and tech. To, to get people to understand the concept of addiction was more, that was almost as difficult as it was to get people to understand that it's, you know, that there's, it exists, and that's it. And, uh, and I just thought that was, just thought that was very touching. Well, every, every major masjid in America needs clinicians, mental health clinicians. That's what I was so proud of what you guys did. Um, the, the problems that I'm seeing in the community now, because of the, the density of Muslims, Lower, metaphor. Um, you have, and that's where it kind of comes back to her question earlier, where you really have to have a multi-passive approach to the community. Like, for example, has anyone seen the videos recently of like converts who are like, like the tattoo girl? No, I'm talking about like, where do you sit there? Like, where, where's like the justice league for people that have been abused in the Muslim community? No, no, where's terminus? Like again, it's like. Couldn't someone just write on YouTube, hey, call 
call this number, there's people here, you can talk to them, they're freaking normal, and you're going to be okay. Wallahi, the sun's going to shine out tomorrow. Just call these people. We didn't have that. We hoot and holler about Syria, Palestine, Egypt. Egypt is great. I've been in Egypt for seven years. I feel you, right? But we can't even build basic institutions to serve really real needs in our community, man. Again, the number of divorces in the Muslim community is around 40%. I have to do a study on it, right? Most Asajj don't have like a post-divorce group or doesn't exist, man. I met a Muslim woman in my community. She's like, I went to a rabbi from marriage counseling. <laughs> I was like, why? She's like, he's the only, he's the only Mulahid, the only person in Jamaica that can give you the proper marriage <clears throat> So I agree with you and I agree with her. It's just it's a multifaceted. Yes, sister. So I come. Um, I'm actually married to an imam in Northern Virginia. And so a lot of what you're saying really resonates. You know, it hits home. Uh, we get complaints all the time that, oh, your mom didn't return my phone call, or so this, so that. Another thing I'm seeing is... You're married to an imam. I'm married oh, to an okay. imam. And, uh, you give a round of applause, dude. She's married to an imam. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a hard life, but I'm happy to that. There's a lot of blessings that come along with it. Uh, so we recognize in our community that we're having a lot of people come in and take shahada, but after they take the shahada, they, they kind of disappear. So we started a new program um, just recently, about three weeks ago. We, ca we call it the meet and greet, so that they could ha they have a place to come back to, but not a hostile environment where like, oh, brother, where's your kufi, sister, where's your hijab? Because they're literally been Muslim for like three minutes. Yeah. So um, I just wanted to get your advice, like, what have you done to encourage them to keep coming back? Other than, yeah. you know, your progressive talks that I see you give, like, uh, what other methods do you have to the keep best, them coming the best, back? The best I've seen is Usama Watali. What's that? Usama Kana Watali is the best. I mean, even in Massachusetts, I struggle. You know, my, the mosque I'm in in, in, in in Boston is primarily first tier immigrant. Wonderful people, incredibly loving, welcoming, friendly people. But they're not really worried about Islam in America. Right now. Yeah. And, and rightfully so. They're worried about my mother lives in a freaking war zone. I have to send money back home. I drive a cab 45 hours a week. So they don't have the capacity. It wouldn't be fair to expect them to, to be able to hang out with d -Lo, who just converted, and like, you know, share a chicken tikka. Right? So, so the best, the best, no, honestly, man, I, I think it's fair to have that expectation. It's not fair, man. And then we blame the immigrant. Why are you blaming the immigrant? Like, honestly, my first wife was an immigrant to America. Like, I saw it's hard. Like, it's not easy coming to this country. It's just not. And we don't give people, like, imagine, like, I have a Somali guy in my community. He's 80 years old. He came to America when he's 75. He, how is he supposed to navigate all this? Right? He's, he doesn't have money. His wife's over there. His kid. So I have a real problem with the dichotomy. Let's get off the topic of immigrant and indigenous. I think it's very problematic. I don't think it's fair to expect from certain communities the capacity to address certain issues that you need to have lived in America for like 30 years, man. You need to know that Nas is not a surah. That Usher is not a surah in the theater, and that 50 cents is not changed. Like, you just don't learn that. Like, you just don't learn that, right? So the best I've seen is really what uh, Osama Cannon is doing at Talib um, with the convert community. Another really good model is what Imam W. Muhammad did. People, people really disregard you know, the efforts that he did in the very beginning to bring you know, well over 150,000 people in three days into Sunni Islam, right? And you see like Imam Safir Rab, you have here in Baltimore, uh, I forgot the other Imam in Baltimore. They do some good work, man. They're not known, Imam Mansour in Minneapolis. They had Masors in front of in front of their mosque for people, single mothers giving massages, man. You know, by Muslim, by Muslim Masors, right? So, the best I've seen is with Sam. He has a program you can go in the summer, it's like a Mu'allah program at Talib. You can train there. And they'll give you, it's very good. Yes, sister in the back. Thanks, sir. Yeah. All your friends are pointing at you. You can like lobby in the room. What you see? So that's not something we should clap about. Something we should clap about. It took okay. 21 years to 
feel respected as a woman in a Muslim community. That's insane. How'd you know that in your teenage years? Oh, um, it's a cognitive dissonance, an exercise in cognitive dissonance. And be a woman and be everything I am. And it wasn't until I left the mission, honestly, that I started practicing. Like, honestly, start praying. Burning out. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, but I wanted to talk to you about, you touched a little about patriarchy and the sexism and misogyny of this community. I feel like, yes, there's racism, but at least we pretend not to be racist in the Muslim American community, but I don't think there's that level of even that facade of pretending wow. really that we respect women unless, you know, the Islamophobe is around the corner. That's when we respect the women. So I kind of wanted you to talk a little about, you know, how can, especially the brothers, um, <laughs> benefit from this sexism in our community? How can you guys really start calling out like I've been in kutbahs where the imam is saying sexist things, and I have to lie. Can you give an example of a sexist thing? Excuse me? Can you give an example of like what you heard? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm not doubting women, that. Literally, women you know, are not as, or there's like a website, islamqna.com, that pops up when you ask. And they literally, if you guys will go right now on your phone, it will say, and it's one of the most popular websites, that women are inferior to men, they're less intelligent than them emotionally, they can't handle anything. I've been in kutbahs where they talk about how sisters uh, should just follow men and how, like I'm an activist, I'm very educated, I'm respected everywhere I go, except when I go into the masjid, I feel like I'm totally silent. I leave be behind the curtain or whatever, I'm fit to not go into the basement, you try to talk to the imam. You know, it's this hypersexualization of Muslim women. Here's the most common one. Brothers, help Islam America by doing X, Y, and Z. Sisters, help Islam, wear your scarf. And that's yeah. not jacked up syllogism, by the way. There's no right. That's very Aristotelian. That's a syllogism right yeah. in front of us. Thanks, bro. Appreciate it. <laughs> no, it's awesome, man. Thank you, Dylan. I used to work at a message, and some brothers, security members, would give me a hard time being on the men's side. But I'd have to be on the men's side in order to go into the lobby, into the office. To You're still just a threat. I'm so intimidated right now. I'm six foot six, and you're how tall are you? I'm terrified. <laughs> no, but you know what? What she said is powerful. So I'm gonna tweet that. That we can fake racism, but we can't fake patriarchy. But we're gonna do a good job of it. And again, I think it goes back. And I, I know it sounds simple. The burning house. You really have to start being invested in creating the places that you want to see. This, this, this loyalty, this loyalty to institutions that are mediocre, right? It needs to end. Like what you said, you found yourself outside the institution. You found your, you found Allah outside of the mosque. That's insanity. Now think about it. People should find God in the mosque. But now we're so frustrated. Honestly, if I was an imam, I would go to the mosque. That's white convert. Like real talk, I'm a white convert that has a little soul in it. Right? So when I don't, when I don't, when I don't, when I don't meet that definition of whiteness, how about a predominant Muslim community? They get nervous. Like really, they think of it. Hi, I'm Imam Will. And like I'm a right grand, and I love One Direction. And, right, but when you're like, so so I agree with you. But I say here, honestly, number one, it goes back to what I said earlier about the thick opinions that are, are most plausible for our reality. People need to go through and rip out that patriarchal stuff. Can I ask you something? Can yeah. I ask you? And I'm sure you're already doing it, and you did it with the last. Uh, I forgot his name, Abu. We won't even call that his name, but oh, yeah. I, I really like, like, you know, some kind of movement with Imam to be the leader, to be to to make this intentional, like not something that kind of touch upon in lectures, but something very intentional because the sisters have been doing it for a long time. But the minute, you know, just like people of color call out racism, but the minute a white person calls it out, then everybody wants to talk about it. But I really think that it needs to be the Imams and, and the brothers in the communities who start calling out the racism, institutional racism in the messages and other places too. Because people, we always talk about how converts are leaving Islam, women are leaving Islam yep, too. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Yeah. And are or, or they're leaving the community. Most people are not leaving Islam, they're leaving the community. Yeah. Right. Uh, let, me, let me say this though. Like Michael like Dyson. Let me say this. <laughs> <laughs> this? Hey, we're in this neighborhood. Um, He's actually got to speak with Nas right now. Yeah, yeah Nas. Um, Nasir. So what, what I would say is that 
what was what was interesting about that issue that we just alluded to was this is one of the first times in history I've ever seen the Muslim community not really care what Imam said and just say this. Those people who thought it was wrong. I thought that's powerful. I think it's very healthy. I think it's very unhealthy to have a community that doesn't question its leadership. And, you know, it should be a, a nice way of questioning people if they're nice. Right? But I thought that was powerful. So, set, first of all, I wouldn't really expect too much from those people. I, Malcolm X said the squeaky hinge gets you crazy. Number, number three, as a follow up, sisters, I would encourage you to reach out to imams and say, How did you respond? Don't let it die. Because there is a feeling in the Imam community that, you know, people were making fitna, Suhaib made a fitna. Why did people speak up to it? Are you telling me that reacting to black people and fried chicken and demeaning women is a fitna? That's insanity. This is not, it is not an ethical dilemma to speak to that. It doesn't take two and a half seconds to think that that's wrong. Right? But our community oftentimes, and that's why I wrote in my response, it wasn't edited. I said, I'm that someone who said what you said. Like, there's no need to use boogeyman. Somebody out there is making fitna. Somebody out there is causing trouble. No, it's me, dude. Like, I don't care. Like, I'm not, we're men. We can address it in a manly way or a womanly way. Sorry for the patriarchal references. But we can, you know, we can speak to it. But I would encourage you now to follow up with imams and say, hey, on the Abu Isa issue, what was your position? And did you speak to power? Don't let it die. Because that's what happens. So I, I met with some imams last weekend. I was at a convention. They were like, man, you shouldn't have done it. You're making fitna, this and that. I was all by myself. And I was like, well, you know, my mother was a member of the ER, dude. If I didn't speak up, <laughs> I had to deal with wrong. And I think also at the same time, people who might not agree with that, if they're respectable, if they're decent, if they're honest in how they address the issue, and you got your opinion, I'll agree with you. Right. Last few questions, we're going to have to make a poll because the rent is up. Yes, brother, in the front. So, uh, I have two things. Sure, go ahead. Number one, when are you moving to DC? Yeah. <laughs> when am I moving to DC? Yeah. Uh, Boston. Daniel. <laughs> Paul <laughs> Pierce. <laughs> <laughs> You never know, wake up. Uh, number two. That's all for the air. Last time you came to DC. Last time you came to DC for mix space, you uh, let us know that you were just recently divorced. And then uh, I visited Canada for the risk conference and it dropped that you just got married. So it was like 30 day window, mashallah? No, I've been divorced for a long time. Oh, okay. So I kept on a deal. Okay. You can't trust the community. Uh, honestly, right? I kept on a deal for a while. And I didn't want to embarrass my wife and my children. Mm -hmm. you know, I, didn't, I didn't want to. Like, I want that out publicly. Yeah, um, that makes sense. I didn't know. I didn't but know I think it's important it. to share with people like, you know, your mom's life is not easy, man. It's just that, man, mashallah. I mean, yeah. my, my, my first wife, I hate her. It's not, it's not like we boxed it. Celebrity death match. But the strain sometimes of, I mean, imagine, man, if my children go online right now and they see some website that do attack attacking me. It's like my kids, man. You know what I mean? Like, those are my children, my daughter, right? I remember one time, Sheikh Hamza, I saw somebody, I mean, just, I mean, I, some people, they have, sister, some people haven't been loved. I mean, honestly, you see the way they treat people, it's like, because love is, Cornel West said, you know, doctor, Cornel West, that love is a transitive verb, man. Like, you gotta pass it on, right? So when you see people attack, like, who could attack him on magic? Who? Like, how do you do that? Right? How? Like, he's the nicest man in the world, right? But then the way that people attack him, because they get security complex. So I remember one time there was a, a you saw a clip of Sheikh Hamza. So people were attacking him. And the picture they had of him, his son was sitting next to him. And I was just like, dude, like, what is wrong with you? You're not a normal freaking person, right? So respond to that. Tell me, like, dude, you're freaking sick, man. Like, how do you attack, like, Dr. Ingrid Madison? Oh, my God, there's a threat to humanity, right? Dr. Ingrid Madison. So, yeah, I, mean, I shared that with people let them know, like, it's, it's human, man. It's a human reality. We have human challenges. We're not perfect. You know what I mean? And, and we need to humanize. It gets back to what she talked about, how 
you know, why do we have to have this dichotomy where you have religious leader and people? Yeah, I mean, someone learned and they study, I trust them, like I trust my friends. Like I got my boy, he knows all the codes to like, you know, some games. So I'm cool with him because he got the codes. But I don't like put him up here, right? Scholars who, who have knowledge, like I respect them for their knowledge and their information. But still, like the Sahaba, they had a friendship with them. Right? There was like a genuine, like when you gave me that card, you gave me a card today, right? It's like, that's beautiful. Like, sister, give me a card, like, roll, like, you know, just what, you know, what you said into my life. That's, that's nice, man. If I was an old guy, bro, give me a card. I don't know. Why would I dang it? You know what I mean? So I think we need to humanize those relationships, man, and, 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 and remove. How are you going to relate to someone who's a cripple? But you can relate to someone who goes through the same crap you go 